In 2015, Google published results of a two-year study into what makes a great team, Project Aristotle. As engineers, we should all improve psychological safety in our teams. Google and others have produced tools to guide teams to understand and improve their effectiveness. While the studies show that the techniques are effective, there are scenarios where I think the guidelines could be harmful. This talk will cover psychological safety and its relevance for SRE teams, what happens in unsafe teams, why to improve it, and how people leaders can help in creating safety. Along with discussing the advantages and pitfalls of each guideline, a framework will be proposed for building psychological safety in diverse SRE teams. What is psychological safety in teams? Psychological safety is when team members can feel safe in taking risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. The term was first introduced by Amy Edmondson, an organisational behavioural scientist from Harvard University. The benefits are more successful and inclusive teams and better delivery performance. The results of Project Aristotle included some guidelines on how to build a great team. Do the guidelines foster diversity? The results found that what really mattered was less about who was on the team and more about how the team worked together. Most team members have these needs, psychological safety, which will be discussed, dependability, when teammates say what they want to do and do what they say, structure and clarity, when the team has an effective decision-making process, meaning, the need to do meaningful work, impact, understanding how the team's work contributes to organisational goals. I'll talk about psychological safety for managers and how they should demonstrate engagement, show understanding, be inclusive in interpersonal settings, be inclusive in decision-making, and show confidence and conviction without appearing inflexible. I'm Catherine Lim. I consult an enabler in Melbourne, Australia. I'm an experienced DevOps engineer who has worked in development and operations for the last 20 years. I've been a team member and managed teams, so I have experiences from both sides. The term psychological safety is new to me. I've learned about it for about four years, but you can reconcile the aspects of the research with what I'd seen in great and not so great teams in my career. I think the best thing I've done for safety in the teams I've been in have been to learn to trust my team members become a trustworthy team member myself. I think that to build the awareness of psychological safety, it needs more voices besides team leads and managers. What individual contributors think is important too. Beyond engagement, team members often say that to feel included, they want a clear team structure so that they can understand their role on the team. They want to be included in the management of the team so they can feel more engaged in the team's mission. Improving these aspects should then foster stronger relationships between team members. And while there is a lack of diversity in the technology industry, studies have shown the value of diverse views in improving a team. By valuing the views of team members who are different from the norms that we experience, we could improve performance and cohesion. And better teams can then go on to create more inclusive outcomes with their goods and services and more inclusivity could then result in better products for the global audience. Now I'm going to present the following topics. Psychological safety, its relevance to SRE teams, why improve psychological safety, how people leaders can help in creating safety, the advantages and pitfalls of psychological safety measures, contrasting data from an Australian psychological safety survey and my proposed framework to improve psychological safety. I've defined psychological safety earlier. Let's talk about measuring it by asking the team. Psychological safety questions should be in a survey where the response could range from strongly disagree, disagree neutral, agree or strongly agree. Depending on the team, the survey could be an anonymous one. Try these survey questions. If you make a mistake on this team, it is often held against you. Members of this team can bring up problems and tough issues. People on this team sometimes reject others for being different. It is safe to take a risk on this team. 
it is difficult to ask other members of this team for help. No one on this team would deliberately act in a way that undermines my efforts. Working with members of this team, my unique skills and talents are valued and utilised. My team believes in communicating on chat than in person. Bear in mind that people in minority or marginalised groups often can't answer freely because their answers could be used against them compared to someone in the more privileged group. For example, gender bias runs deep. In some workplaces, women are not free to be vulnerable. Not all the questions account for cultural differences. Which ones could they be? Compare those survey questions to these discussion questions. What are some of your strengths that are currently underutilized by the team? What are your strengths that the team can count on you for? What is the recent mistake that you made but that you learned a lot from? What skills or areas of improvement are you trying to develop? In a safe team, team members would be happy to discuss the above in real time. Real life examples would be discussed and feedback would be welcome. Underutilized strengths, mistakes, and areas of improvement would be discussed without fear of vulnerability. In an unsafe team, expect generic answers like, I'm dependable. Only small mistakes would be mentioned, so as not to reveal any major weaknesses. And some generic skills to develop could be brought up. And next, let's talk about its relevance to SRE teams. In general, an SRE team is responsible for the availability latency, performance, efficiency, change management, monitoring, emergency response, and capacity planning of their services. These are key responsibilities held by the SRE team that affect the health and safety of a service. According to Google, the team should cap operational work at 50% or less and use the rest on project work, pursue maximum change velocity without violating a service's SLO, ensure that Monitoring only notifies a human when they need to act. Prepare engineers to react to emergencies using playbooks and simulation exercises. Increase change management safety by using automation to implement progressive rollouts. Detect problems and roll back changes safely when issues arise. And take the steps necessary to implement demand forecasts and regular load testing of systems to service capacity. If there was no psychological safety, team members would be engaged in finger pointing exercises. They'd rely on hero engineers in emergency response situations. They'd guard availability rather than improve performance or efficiency. They wouldn't be trusted in practicing change management. And they would not engage in capacity planning because the numbers would be held against them. From the above negative behaviours, I hope you can see that some of the reasons to improve psychological safety. Improving psychological safety has many benefits. It may help to create an environment that is conducive to learning. Such an environment would encourage information sharing and learning behaviours. Learning behaviours include seeking information, experimenting and reflecting. For example, team members may be more likely to discuss mistakes share ideas, ask for and receive feedback and experiment. Such a team could experience higher levels of employee satisfaction. This could lead to more engagement, which is defined as the emotional commitment to the organization and its goals. Engaged team members are less likely to leave their jobs. And finally, with all the benefits already mentioned, an engaged and committed team would improve the team's performance and benefit the whole business who is responsible for creating safety? People leaders. People leaders can build psychological safety in their teams. They need to understand what makes team members not feel engaged, feel unsafe expressing new ideas or trying new things. Leaders need to encourage people to be in protective and really ask themselves if they feel safe making a mistake. They should be able to provide a forum where team members can feel comfortable sharing these feelings. Occasionally, this can be done with technology to collect feedback data and enable leaders to get an understanding of team culture and engagement.
Pulse checks can then help managers identify troubles and improvement opportunities. Leaders need to establish a culture of trust. They can do this by understanding and respecting the needs of all people for inclusion, validation, competence, and social acceptance. Embracing conflict consciously to empathize with others and resolve conflicts while promoting a win-win outcome. Avoiding blame and criticism by focusing on the issues and facts. Modeling curiosity by being open to learning more and understanding both sides of the issue. And celebrating taking risks and having non-open, non-threatening conversations about failure. Now that I've explained the benefits and how leaders can help to make it work, let's talk about the advantages and pitfalls of psychological safety measures. This part is about measuring rather than the techniques. The insights from studies indicate that psychological safety has a role in enabling team performance. It is relevant for understanding organizational learning. How learning behaviors can be limited by individual concerns about interpersonal risks or consequences. Generally, it confirms that individuals who experience greater psychological safety are more likely to speak up at work. Safety takes time to build. One of the pitfalls is that it can be destroyed instantly by one negative response to an act of vulnerability, like blame for a mistake or criticism for trying something new, or slowly by unresolved conflicts and difficulties. Most of the research has been conducted in English-speaking countries. Not enough studies from non-English-speaking countries mean that we need more research to validate psychological safety across a wider cross-section of different types of teams, organisations and countries. There needs to be more studies to examine how psychological safety changes over time. It could be possible that it becomes less effective over time as people become too comfortable with each other, resulting in more casual conversations and less work on engaging and learning for performance. Even if a company has a strong culture, it won't make employees feel safe to speak up, ask for help or provide feedback. The reason for this is the behaviours of local managers and leads who can all have different styles and behaviours. This could result in different messages about the consequences of taking personal risks. Diverse teams have many benefits, including a wider range of perspectives, talents, skills, and experiences from people of different backgrounds working together. However, diverse teams could be affected by language barriers, value conflicts, reasoning and decision-making differences, stereotypes, and bias. Minority group members can experience high levels of anxiety due to exclusion, discrimination, harassment, rudeness, lower access to resources for job performance, fewer role models, lack of access to networks, pay inequality, and fewer opportunities for career progression. And some studies show that women experience lower levels of psychological safety compared with men. Minority team members may engage in masking their differences in order to fit in and avoid some of the stresses mentioned previously. However, this has significant costs and the individual and organizational level. Employees who engage in these strategies are behaving in a way which is incongruent with their cultural values, negatively impacting their sense of self. At the organizational level, the emotional dissonance becomes a demotivating force that makes them feel less committed to the organization, lowers their sense of belonging to, to the organization, and less likely to perceive opportunities to advance and more likely to have considered leaving the organization in the last 12 months. Now I'm going to present some results from a psychological safety survey. In 2017, in a world first, the Australian Workplace Psychological Safety Survey collected perceptions of psychological safety from a diverse cross-section of workers. Overall, the results indicated low levels of psychological safety with significant variations across income, age, gender, and education level. Overall, 
Only 24% of respondents reported feeling safe to take risks at work. Lower income earning staff experience lower levels of psychological safety than higher income learning colleagues. Only 23% of lower income earning frontline employees felt that their workplace was psychologically safe to take a risk, compared to 45% of workers on significantly higher incomes. Younger respondents were more concerned with mistakes being held against them compared with older respondents, 12 to 21%. Younger respondents found it significantly more difficult to ask colleagues for help, 24% strongly agreed compared with the average, 18% strongly agreed. Men were more likely to report that it was safe to take risks at work, 38% strongly agreed or agreed compared with women, 29% strongly agreed or agreed. The higher level, the education level of a respondent, the more likely they were to feel safe to take risks. Almost 40% of people who had received a degree or above agreed to feeling safe to take risks at work, while only 25% of people who had completed year 10 or a trade apprenticeship agreed. 58% of all respondents felt that their colleagues often reject others for being different. I can believe these results. Hopefully things have improved. For us in technology, in the high performing teams or high performing organizations with measured levels, high levels of psychological safety, those results should be interesting. You can take a wider look around other teams or your organization and you may find similar results. In my society, I see a lot of potential in diverse teams and diverse leadership. Here's a proposed framework for teams and leaders that works with diversity. Be pro-diversity and foster diverse teams. Leaders should support diversity as a competitive advantage for innovation and growth and should try to establish diverse teams. Foster a culture of respectful debate. A competitive approach to conflict has a win-lose outcome, whereas a cooperative approach to conflict has a win-win outcome. In a cooperative conflict, group members can share their ideas, take the perspective of others, confirm their commitment to resolving the conflict for mutual benefit, and integrate diverse perspectives to create new solutions. One solution, one approach could be for team members to use sticky notes to post their ideas anonymously around the room. The manager then facilitates a group discussion of the ideas to look for the best way to integrate those ideas to achieve the group's shared objectives. This contrasts with a competitive event where team members compete against each other face-to-face -face in a brainstorming session. Avoid blame and criticism. Provide room to experiment and fail. Leaders should provide protection and support for team members in innovation and delivery efforts. Deal with performance issues using factual and neutral language. Acknowledge mistakes and be willing to admit you don't have all the answers. Others can speak up to fill the gaps and to own and share from their own mistakes. Acknowledge minority input. Confirmation bias and affinity bias can lead team members to discount the views of minority members. Deliberately acknowledge minority input to show the group that all views are valued. Be curious and ask questions to encourage team members to voice their ideas and demonstrate a willingness for diverse perspective and ideas. When people feel that others want to hear from them and value their perspectives, they are more likely to speak up in discussions. Set clear goals and expected results to recognize the contrib contribution of diversity and collaboration for high performance. Develop friendship. Trust has two components, effective-based trust and cognitive-based trust. Effective-based trust is emotional and forms as a result of frequent positive interpersonal interactions where individuals share personal information. Cognitive-based trust develops from the demonstration of competence. Effective-based trust improves intimacy and openness. When group members develop effective-based trust, 
They are less concerned about exposing their weaknesses or vulnerabilities and less suspicious of the members' intentions. Effective base trust reduces the risk of fault lines and promotes the open sharing of knowledge and ideas. The success of a psychological safety improvement effort should be tracked using formal surveys. It would be best to use a third-party survey provider to provide the results without exposing the respondents. Informal team surveys could be prone to masking and miss out on valid concerns. To recap, when Google published Project Aristotle, I wanted to learn more about psychological safety in teams. There's a lot of guidance for leaders to foster team safety. Thinking back to the great managers you worked with, which ones had used the techniques I mentioned? I wanted the presentation to be relevant for team members as well. And in order for a team to improve its psychological safety, the techniques I've presented will help individuals to align their behaviours to a high-performance team. Teams are more diverse now, which is why I've included diverse teams in the framework. As shown in the 2017 Australian survey, safety in teams is not as improved as it could be. Before we close, I would like to present a challenge to you based on what we just discussed. The challenge for the audience is to find which behaviours to improve and think about actions to take to be successful at those behaviours. In this way, I'm sure you can help improve psychological safety in your teams. Are you already experiencing high levels of psychological safety in your teams? Then your challenge is to find out why. Can you link them to the benefits I talked about? In closing, it has been a fun research project to present this talk. Through the references in Project Aristotle, I've had the opportunity to go through the earlier research and read about the shortcomings which can be improved in time by future studies. I've talked about what happens in safe teams and unsafe teams. The benefits of safety are especially important to SRE teams being responsible for the health and performance of key systems. Without a goal of becoming a high performance team, SRE teams will find it difficult to build trust in other teams and the rest of the organization. It's important for leaders to be supported to improve psychological safety, and they need to coach team members to display the behaviors that make a high performance team. I hope that you will have learned something from my presentation and now know some of the shortcomings of the research. I hope that my framework to support diverse teams is useful to some people. Thanks to Unix and SRECon for having me and thank you for listening to my talk.